let us uh, let us pray father thank you so much for tonight thank you for the opportunity to gather around your word um, always 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 good to be with in your presence with your children with your word always incredible how you reveal yourself to us through your word um, so that we can understand and grasp and learn and grow and go and be transformed and bear fruit bring this good news to the world around us and father that is why you have gathered us here is to see how you want us to be good disciples well, the last one of, one of the last things that you share with us is go and make disciples and so if we need to go and make disciples then we need to know what that means to be a disciple and then how, how do you do that and so i pray that we will truly learn <coughs> from that um, so that we can fulfill this great commission this last command that you gave well and thank you for the challenge that we have the the challenge bigger than what we can accomplish by ourselves through our own human energy and planning and resources to go and do this in our Jerusalem Judea Samaria and to the ends of the earth this is a task much wider than, than just our own little comfort zones it seems to me we need to add God to the equation to fulfill this great commission. And so, Father, may you truly be in this through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Holy Spirit, we just want to pray right now that you will take control, that you will take over, that you will bless and lead and guide us. And that this Bible study will become encounters with the living God, feeding our souls and changing our lives. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So friends, thank you so much for joining this. Um, uh, Melissa and Colleen asked that we think a little bit about what discipleship could look like and what it means. and. And so I um, thought, well, let's, let's go to where Jesus picked the disciples and trained them and then unleashed them into the world, right? So, so I think that's a great place to learn what that could look like. Of course, we see that in the letters of Paul as well. But for this um, couple of weeks, we're going to journey together and we're going to look at what, uh, what we can learn, gather from, from the Gospels. And we're going to do that together over nine lessons. You see that on page two. Um, so every time you're welcome to bring that folder with you. And then when you come the next lesson, if this is your first time joining us, the next lesson will be available for you. And you just add that until at the end, God willing, if I'm still alive, we, we have nine of those together, right? Um, if not, then somebody else will lead the tour to Israel. Uh, Debbie will do that. <laughs> so um, <laughs> at least you'll be prepared then, Debbie, right? Yeah. So you will. <laughs> You've come from the gospel, so what else do you need, right? <laughs> so um, so we, we, we're going to walk through the gospels and we're going to jump around a little bit, okay? Uh, because we're, we're going to pull certain themes from all four of the Gospels. So we're not going to, usually we, we go chronologically through a certain book, but this, this Bible study will work a little bit differently because it's a thematic one, and so we're going to go through the theme. So um, if you open up your Bible in Matthew chapter 1 or your app or whatever you have with you, and we're going to... Um, start right there in Matthew chapter 1 I'm going to be mostly in the first couple of chapters of each of the four Gospels um, and then in Matthew chapter 1 we find the genealogy of, of Jesus and that's one of the first things that we read there that's very interesting um, the Greek would literally say a record of the Biblos Genesios the a record of the book of 
Genesio. Does that sound familiar? So, sounds kind of like Genesis, right? It uh, sounds kind of like the beginning of things, right? So, so this is, he says, a, a record of the book of the beginning of the creation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of, of Abram. In, in, in other words, um, Matthew is helping us to see that this is not just a historical list that he's sharing, right? In fact, very few of the genealogies that you find in the Bible would simply be historical. Um, to tell the truth, if you would want to be historical and, and go literally like who was this person born to and who was that one born to and who was that one born to, you will find mistakes in all of the genealogies. The reason is that we are, the moment we look at historical kind of things, you are looking for facts. You know, you look back in time and you're looking at facts, right? Why not, if I say I was born to Nick and Nick was born to another Nick, he was really, and that Nick was born, you know, uh, to a burger and so on. Uh, you know, you will want to go back home to South Africa with me and find these people. Um, in biblical times, history was often tied to what, what, what did you want to communicate? And so you would use certain things in the past simply as pointers or, you know, help that you find in history to help you to make a point. So some, some of the genealogies are following um, the, the royal family life of people. So, so that person could be born from someone in that family. And it doesn't matter necessarily whose name is being attached to it. It's about what is the point that that genealogy is trying to make. In this case, the point that that genealogy would like to make would simply be this person comes from royalty, right? This person comes from royalty. Oh, you got to, oh, there you are. Oh, you're a wonderful man. You are a disciple. Um, <laughs> that's it. Class is done for you. Go home. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> um, so um, uh, then, then. And, uh, yeah, um, and, and then some other genealogies uh, w would want to point out some theological truth, right? So, so it depended on what, what, was, what did you want to communicate. Matthew writes um, not only but also to a Jewish audience, okay? So there's a lot of people in his area that would read his work that would be Jewish. And so he wants to prove to the Jews right from the start that Jesus Christ also came for the Jews. Also came for the Jews. Now, if you were a strong Jew, you would want to pick this up and you would want to see from the genealogy what? Jesus came from the Jews for the Jews, right? But Matthew is also a Christian, right? He also found life in Christ. So he does not only want to help him to see that Jesus is from the Jews, but, but that he is through the Jews, for the Jews and the world. So he wants him to kind of see that as well. So he, he, he knows what will get them excited is if they can clearly see th that from the Jewish nation, you know, things led up to Jesus. He wants them to clearly see that. But right from the beginning, he wants to widen them. So he plays a little bit with their mind and say that this is the genealogy of Jesus, but this is the, this is the beginning of Jesus, the creation of Jesus. So, so he connects them with God, the creator, and Jesus being part of that creation, right? So from the beginning, he messes with them a little bit. And then he starts off and he says, okay, this is, this is how this is going. Um, there are 14 generations from 
Abram was the father of Isaac up to King David and from King David up to the exile in Babylon, verse 11, and from verse 12, verse 12 the um, exile to Babylon up to the end in verse 16, it says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Go like that is a weird way to say things right because by now what you have heard was verse 10 is a guy of a father of manasseh manasseh the father of amen right and then verse 13 zerubbabel the father of abuet and abuet the father of el yakim and and when you read in verse 15 eliot the father of eleazar eleazar the father of Mathan, and then in verse 16 you read and jacob the father of joseph and joseph the father of jesus would you agree by this time you condition to read that and then you go like and Joseph the and Jacob the father of Joseph the husband of Mary and he's like what you know um, did he add a slip of his pen or you know by this time got tired and confused or what is happening here right something is wrong do you agree mm -hmm. something is is changing something up why on earth is he changing it he had a nice rhythm going here in, in, you know in, 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 in fact um, in, in the ancient society you know you, you, you did not worry about last names the only thing that you were concerned about is who is your father because you were supposed to be a what of your father you were supposed to be a son we, we have this incredible word in oh. in our time that they did not have in biblical times <laughs> you were supposed to be a a clone of your father and we understand that word completely right unfortunately we cannot always use um, one and only son because that is who Jesus is right he's not just the son he's being introduced by the Gospels as what there as the one and only son of God right but but one and only son in our world does not really do it for us anymore and that's why we sometimes struggle and think of Jesus as you know separate from god god is the father jesus is the son and then somewhere the holy spirit features and you go like well that's kind of like a little ghost that can be in you so that can be kind of one even though it's two so that makes sort of sense but a son cannot be in his father that just doesn't make sense so is it two gods or one god and perhaps it's three gods that sometimes two how does this work we struggle with it because in our world even if you did not have just the oldest son, which, which this is supposed to reflect here, the son of, the son of, the son of, you know, in, in our world, even if you would say, um, my son's name is Nikki, even if I would say Nikki is my one and only son, you still think of two people. Do you agree? Right? You, you, you still think of Nikki is you know if i would call nikki in here and he speaks exactly like i speak you go like nikki what do you want to be one day i want to be a pastor and a teacher and a missionary and go like well, that's like your dad um, nikki where do you work i work for one plus god ministries uh, and, and, and nikki uh, what do you eat you know i eat pop and pop, pop and meat you know um, some south african food right nikki what don't you like i absolutely don't like pizza you go like man that's just like wayne you know? <laughs> who on earth wants to eat pizza you know a bread with that. some weird stuff on it that you you know warm up that just sounds yucky what on earth you know who would eat that you know, and, and so, 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 you, so you, you talk with Nikki and go like, man, this is just like Nikki. And you say, you ask me, you know, wow, Nikki is kind of similar to you. And I go like, yeah, absolutely. Isn't it great? I told him from birth, you're going to be a pastor, a teacher, a missionary. That's what you are. You don't like pizza. No pizza. You know, don't go close to dangerous. It makes you fat really quickly. No, don't worry about that. <laughs> so, stay away. You know, so, so, and you go like, man, that's a, that's a bad dad. He never gave his son opportunity to be who his son wants to be in life right you're supposed to raise your children strong stand on their own two feet make their own choices be their own person Th that's our culture that's our society would you agree mm -hmm. right 
in the so, but if if you would meet Nikki and you come to me afterwards and you ask me why is Nikki so similar to you and I tell you I paid a lot of money for you know some um, scientist in Germany Nikki is my clone <laughs> would it be a mystery you, to you anymore why Nikki is the same it would not be a mystery right because he is my clone and you would go like, even though it's two people, they are exactly the same. It's one person. It's just a clone of the other one, right? And so in the ancient world, when you use the word one and only son, that son's entire purpose in life was to duplicate oh. his father. It was... Uh, it was about honor about honor you see our world the best thing in our world or what makes our world go around no, not, not the best thing what makes our world go round and round for some people it is the best thing it is what? it's money right? Mm -hmm. money makes our world go around and around in the ancient world it was not money it was honor so in our world it's money so it's like, my son, you need to what? You need to get a job. Otherwise, you won't have what? You won't have money, you know? So don't become a missionary pastor. No money, right? <laughs> Poor. Bad choice. I'm not saying, you know, but you understand, right? So, so you, you, you want to get a job, go to college, do whatever you want to do, or, you know, because you need money to function in life. And if you do that well, you work hard, you earn your own keep, you don't have to borrow money from your dad anymore, what do we as fathers say? Good son, you're honoring me. How are you honoring me? By standing on your own two feet, work hard, not borrow money from me all the time, all those things. In the ancient world, you honor me how? by saying you are the best they can be there is no one better than you i want to talk like you I, I i want to treat my wife like you i want to do what you do i want to be you and so therefore jesus says things like he says things like i only say to you what my father has given me to say i only do what my my father does. My father works on the Sabbath and so do I. You know, um, so, so he says, you have seen me. When you have seen me, you have seen my father. You want to know the way to my father? You go through me. Because me and the father, uh, we the same. Yes. So I have a question. Did other people in the ancient times say my one and only son? Or is that strictly just what we say about Jesus? No, they, they would also say that if they only had one son. Okay, and it so, would mean a clone and people really understood yes, that phrase. Yes, yes. So we just don't understand it as well as they understood it. Right, okay, right. And, um, of course, one and only son would just be so much more important because there's nobody else who can do it if the son would die or something would happen before the dad dies. So, and then also the oldest son would be treated as the one and only, even if he was not the one and only. The oldest would be treated as the one and only. Other sons might be able to do something else, kind of go off the path, but the oldest son does that? Horrible, terrible, right? Inexcusable. So, so therefore, um, it was, it was, it's, a pro it's problematic for us sometimes to understand that God the Father and God the Son is one. It was not problematic for the people in Jesus' time because if they hear that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and He does exactly the same as the Father, speaks the same things, do the same things, exercise the same power as God, then he has to be God. And the same God, not a different God, not two gods, anything like that. So for them that would make complete sense. And so therefore, 
knowing this, Matthew and the other Gospels, we'll see in a little bit, stays clear to help the people to see that um, Joseph is, is not the physical, biological dad of Jesus. And therefore, when he gets there, he makes something really clear. He, he, he gets to Jesus in a roundabout way. How do you get to Jesus in a roundabout way? To put a woman in there. Because that would stop everybody. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. You put a woman in the list of genealogy, has something gone wrong with you? You had too much wine to drink, you know, Matthew, what happened to you? You know, you cannot do that, right? So here's your next, uh, I'm helping you, right? If you want to do your next women's conference, here's your verse. That's what you need to do. About, right? All the women will go like, yay, we have arrived. You know, so Joseph is being introduced first as the husband of Mary. And sorry to burst your bubble, it has nothing to do with feminism. It has everything to do with, so sorry. <laughs> has everything to do with helping his audience to understand that this Jesus is separate. There's something different about him. Joseph is the husband of Mary, but not introduced as the father of Jesus. The husband of Mary, but Mary from whom Jesus was born. Also not even introduced as the mother of, right? of whom Jesus was born. So he tries to avoid with very carefully um, to help the Jews to understand that there is some incredible, something incredible about Jesus. And then this concludes with, thus there were 14 generations is all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to Christ, right? So these these big portions in the history of the um, Jewish people, right? They were called in uh, with Abram. Uh, Genesis 15 to 17, God comes to Abram. I want to be your God. You want to be my people. That incredible journey with the Jews start. It kind of has its peak in King David. Would you agree? You know, the, the borders of Israel was never as big as in the time of um, King David. And, and then from his son it starts, but, you know, wives take him off the wrong path with all the idols and whatever. Uh, and then that, that goes south, right? After that, ends up in, in exile. Um, and so from exile down to where they come back from exile um, to, where, to where Jesus is being born, 14, 14, 14. So this is a big number for the Jews, an important number for the Jews. And 14, of course, also the number of David, of King David, right? So um, there was a game in the, that, the, that the Jews would play, the name of the game. You might have heard this um, when we, some of you were here when we, when we did the, um, the book of um, Revel Revelation. And... Um, so um, this game, uh, it, it has to do with numbers, right? So in the Hebrew uh, language, you don't have numbers. So certain letters are attached to a number value. Um, the original Hebrew did not have um, vowels, right? So these little things over here that would that with these things here, and sometimes there would be some things at the top here, the Davi does not have that, but um, these vowels here um, was added later because some people could not read it anymore without the vowels. You will see soon some of the newspapers in Israel nowadays still only have the consonants and not the vowels. Um, so people can read it without the vowels. And so um, David, uh, is like that, okay? So, <laughs> Aleph would be one, Bait would be two, Gimel would be three, Dalet would be four, Dalet is D, this is a D, right? So, what's the number value of the Dalet? Is four, okay? 
and being the vav in the middle, so Aleph, Bay, Gimel, Dali, Hey, Vav. Vav is six, right? So the number value is six. So four plus six plus four equals 14. We don't really do that anymore, but we do. Um, one very, very familiar example to Americans is for South Africans, it is 1216, December 16. For any South African that you would say the numbers 1216 to, they would Im immediately say it reminds us in our history of a day when we were in peril, a big enemy against us, um, outnumbered completely. We pray to God, God save us. If you save us, we will build a big monument. It's called the Fur Tracker Monument. Um, and uh, you know, the biggest monument in South Africa, I'm sure if you just Google biggest monument in South Africa, you probably don't even have to remember Afrikaans name. <laughs> it will probably pop up. you a big stone building on a hill in the city of Pretoria. So just type big, Largest monument in South Africa in the capital city that will probably pop up, okay? Um, and, and so that we built that monument so that we would never forget, so we call it the Day of the Vow. You can Google that, Day of the Vow, there's not an Afrikaans word in there. So Day of the Vow reminds us of the day when God saved us, right? Against all odds. And so for you guys, what is one of those numbers? There's many, I'm sure, in your history. One is 9-11, right? If I say 9-11, even if you were born on 9-11, you will not think of your birthday first. You will think of the Twin Towers that fall, right? That number is etched in your memory. And in the Jewish nation, you had the same thing. But the number 14 was a good number, a number where God is involved in. You know, God is blessing this. This, this is not just something that happens. This is God that's steering this. So if Jesus is being born at the peak of 14 generations times 3, King David's name's number, right? Everything leading up to King David, that from King David onwards, okay? So if, if, if God is at work there, how surely is God in work, at work in that? Surely, surely, surely. Because any time that something is being repeated in the Bible three times, it's for what purpose? To emphasize it, right? To say it's definitely so. Um, so it's being emphasized three times. God is at work here. So who is at work? with this Jesus that's being born. What is Matthew trying to tell his Jewish um, audience? This man is not just another Jew. This man is not just another David, another Solomon, uh, you know, another Abram, uh, uh, another Joseph. This man that's being born here is of God. This book of his creation, this book that, you know, goes in a weird roundabout way to say that Joseph was in the picture, Mary was in the picture, but he was born of Mary in a way that nobody talked like that. Do you understand? Nobody talked like that. In that time, it would catch your ear. It would be like, that is just so weird. It's like when somebody tells you, pizza is terrible, don't eat it. It's like something is wrong. This man must come from a different planet, you know. <laughs> we need to educate him, you know. Please help the dude, you know. Um, so, so, do you understand? It catches your ear, right? How many times do you hear the, pizza, the word pizza? And you never stop thinking. You just continue with your day. But when I say... I cannot stand a pizza. You go like, what is wrong with the dude, right? <laughs> Do you understand? <laughs> that this stopped them, right? They would read it, they would listen to it, and it would stop them. They would go like, what are you doing here, right? And then on top of that, it doesn't end here. Mary is not the only woman, right? There are other women in this genealogy. And so there's this woman, um, Tamar. Do you remember Tamar? This three whose mother was Tamar, probably a Canaanite, 
right, that Judah had intercourse with, and you can go home and read that, we don't have time for all of that, but Tamar was not a Jewish woman. What is a non-Jewish woman doing in a Jewish genealogy? Do you agree with me? That, that is like, why on earth are you doing this? And then not only that, <laughs> verse 5, Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Rahab! You remember from Joshua, the, the spies, you know, that you need to hide in the house of Rahab, who was what? The, the princess. No. Uh, what was she again? Prostitute. Oh, prostitute. I got the P right at least, right? No, she was, uh, you know, so, so she's from, she's from, you know, she's a bad woman. She, she, is she a Jew? She, she's definitely not a Jew, right? <laughs> and, and then um, Obed, this five, whose mother was Ruth. Ruth was from the, the, the Moabites, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so Ruth is not a Jew. And then, of course, kind of the cherry on the cake, dear brother David, of course, his sin needs to come out, right? You know, um, he was the father of Solomon. And then Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife, probably Matthew could not get himself so far as to write actually Bathsheba there. So Uriah's wife, right? Uh, Uriah was, was a Hittite. Do you remember that? And it's like, oh my goodness gracious, you have these women of, you know, doubtful stature that, that ended up in a Jewish genealogy. Matthew, have you lost your mind? Thank you for getting us so excited to showing the 14, 14, 14 category, Jewish category. Thank you for getting us excited that Jesus was born from the Jewish nation. But now this is crazy. And so Matthew continues to write his gospel to help the people to understand what? The disciples of Jesus Christ as Jesus himself, right? What is a disciple? It's someone going from one place to another place to bring the good news of God to that place. Do you agree with me? Did Jesus go from one place to another place to bring the good news of God to another place? I think so. Who was the first disciple? Please don't tell me it was the first disciple that Jesus called. Who was the first disciple? Jesus was the first disciple, right? <laughs> so it's like those Sunday school questions that you cannot get wrong, right? The, no matter what the question is, the answer always gets to be Jesus, right? <laughs> Otherwise the kids feel bad and they never come back. So, um, <laughs> so Jesus is the first disciple, right? Jesus is the first disciple. He's the one coming from God, doing a great job helping people to understand the message from God. That's what we are here for. That's what we're trying to get. So what are one of the first, very first things that you see here? Um, I wrote it down there for you, the, first, the third bullet point there. Um, a disciple of Jesus uh, brings the possibility of a new creation... The possibility of a new creation. The possibility of something completely new. Right? This is the genealogy of, of someone completely new. Of something completely new. This genealogy is going to show you something completely new. It's going to break into this world. <coughs> something completely new. Through the Jewish nation. But not to the Jewish nation. Through the Jewish nation to the world which includes the Jewish nation. To the world. So the first lesson that is often so hard for us to get when we hear that we are disciples. You have been born into the American people group. Or into, like Sovereign Me, the South African people group. Speaking your language, having your culture, enjoying pop and not pizza, your culture, <laughs> but to do what? To bring this good news, this new thing, only to your people group. No, also to your people group. To the world which includes your people group. And who are these disciples? 
literally all of you the moment you accept Jesus Christ because the moment you accept Jesus Christ you become his child and the moment you grow up as being his child you realize that you can pick any job in this world but that job needs to have the purpose of being a disciple of Jesus Christ my dad was a blue collar worker in the coal mine but his purpose was to raise a child that is a disciple to the world. That's your purpose. I don't care what job you have. We all have the same purpose. You have pastors that don't get that. The pastor that followed me in South Africa, one of the first things that he did was to kill all of the international missions and said it was a waste of money or whatever reason he had. It's a pastor who doesn't get it. That you can be a pastor, but your purpose is to be a disciple to your own people also, not only to them, to the world. So you cannot say, I'm too old, I don't know other languages, I don't have enough money, um, you know, I'm not well spoken, or whatever. The, the question is, how am I a disciple of Jesus to the world? And it might be sitting with your grandchild and reading a book about OPG and explaining to your grandchild that the world is bigger than just this one where people speak English and enjoy pizza. <laughs> right? Right? Right. 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 right new beginning to everybody can you imagine what it must have meant for a prostitute to hear this mm. what it must have meant for an adulterous woman Bathsheba to hear this who was tricked by a man a great man right sadly many wonderful women are being tricked by great men right sometimes even Many in leadership positions, as you've seen in this country, I've been here 14 years and I've seen many great men do that to women, right? How incredible for a woman to hear such great new beginnings is possible for me. Who brings this news to people who need to hear, long to hear? new beginnings new creations is possible in my life do you know someone like that who would long to hear that a new beginning could also be possible in my life and that the first disciple cared about that and therefore you should care about that and so going to luke Luke, you know, goes like a, a mile further <laughs> and, 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 um, and he goes back and he says in um, Luke chapter th um, 3, um, the genealogy there is not right at the beginning because Luke was a medical doctor and he's very interested in um, showing us exactly how Jesus was born. And so we go to Luke chapter 3 verse 23. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry and Jesus was the son of Joseph, right? <laughs> uh oh, uh, you have your Bible has something else? <laughs> no, that's what it says. Oh, so, so it was thought. So it was thought, right? He was the son, so it was thought of, G of Joseph. So, so this is Luke's way of saying that there was a tie, right? There was a bond to Joseph and Mary, but a different kind of a bond, right? So it was thought. That, you know, that Jesus was the son of Joseph in a biological way. And, and he's trying to say with that, stick around, read the rest of my gospel. This is like a great, you know, mystery novel writer, right? You, you, you say something 
And you're kind of like, what on earth does he mean by that? I guess I need the race. We need to read the race, right? And then you read the race and you go like, oh, okay, that's what he means by it, right? He was, he was the son, but not the son in a biological way. He was given to him as a son, right? An adopted son, a son adopted from heaven, from God himself. And then it ends in verse 37, Canaan, the son of Enosh, verse 38, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. The son of Adam, the son of God. So how does Luke do that? Luke takes his genealogy of Jesus back to what? Back to Adam and Adam, the son of God. the son of God. Right. So this is Luke's way of saying Jesus is not just human, not only human, not just born in a normal way, not only part of the Jewish nation. And Luke specifically is a traveling doctor. He goes all throughout the whole wide world on the ships and so on, where he would care for people often on these big ships. And that's how he encounters Paul. And Paul is with him on these ships and he writes many of um, Paul's stories down, right? And so therefore, um, as he shares this, he has in mind who is his audience. Only the Jewish people? No, 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 no. Many of them, Greek Romans, right? Whom he also wants to come to Christ. And he wants to, you know, be there for the Jews, but then he wants the Greeks and Romans to acknowledge that before the Jewish nation was called, before Abram, there was Adam. And before Adam, there was God. This Jesus is from God through the Jewish nation for the world, which includes the Jews and includes everybody else. And I'm telling you, if you're reading this, you know, for your own people group, they get excited about it. But you read it to another people group, they're less excited about it, right? Because, well, we're not, a, we're not Jews. There are so many people that are in people groups often that feel, can this also be for us? Can this also be for us? Um, a couple of years ago, God granted us the opportunity and I took a, a small group of people on a mission trip to Papua. And um, so we arrived there in Papua. It's uh, extremely remote. It looks like, I don't know if you've ever seen a movie of Sam's, uh, um, not Sam's, what's the guy? Um, uh, Tarzan, Tarzan and Jane, right? Um, yeah, I guess he's like Samson. But the, 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 um, you know, Tarzan and Jane movie, like you know, like the jungle, right? It looks literally like that. And so the missionaries had cleaned cleaned up a, a little spot there, and they're working with the Moscona people group. And we we land there on in this little little, little plane, and we get off there, and there's a long line of people that want to see us. And, um, and so they've, they've only seen these two, two missionaries all of their lives. And, um, and so suddenly there's all these people there. And um, the next day, the missionary come and he say to us, you know, some of the people might be a little bit tired today. And I say, why? You know, we have people struggling with jet lag, not them. You know, <laughs> says, well, they've been debated uh, until two, three o'clock in the morning around the fires. I said, well, what, what, what did they debate? You know, because we haven't even started to speak with them yet, right? We haven't said a word yet. And he said, the debate was, the debate was, are they truly so special that God would send these people to travel for days, thousands of miles. They cannot speak their language. But yet God had seen all these white people <laughs> to arrive in this jungle to sit with them. Is it possible that God could love them so much to have sent these people all the way to come to me? And then there's people that wants to have a debate with me. It's a small, it's a short term mission strip with the money and the distance and blah, blah, blah. They don't know what they're talking about because they forget that if God is part of it, 
the only thing that you need to do so let me just take the pressure off of this thing of what should I say, what should I say, how should I say it, what should I say, how should I say it, because a disciple needs to speak, and that's true too. You need to speak. But before you speak, the most important thing that you need to do is what? For heaven's sake, please show up. Will you just please, please, Please show up. So many people are so afraid when they think of a disciple that's been called to bring this incredible news to people. They're so afraid of what they will say that they never go. They never show up. So the broken person or the person from another people group, whether they can speak your language or not, or the neighbor across the street, or, or the colleague that you've never spoken to, but you know there's a big sadness, a big battle in their life. You, 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 I can give you the most fanciest speech on Mother Earth, but none of it helps if you don't do what? If, if you don't show up. You know, your mouth kind of goes to where your body is. I don't know if you've realized that yet. You know? <laughs> but you have to show up. You have to show up. And when you show up, disciple of the Most High, who has also shown up? God. The first disciple. Jesus. Have also shown up. When his disciples show up, the first disciple has also shown up. And you might not know what to say, but he does. And you might not even have started a conversation. And Jesus is already conversing with the entire tribe until two o'clock in the morning. I'm not sure. If I would be able to keep them awake until two o'clock in the morning. What could I say? But to be so grandiose. To keep the people going until two o'clock in the morning. And not fall asleep and die in the fire. <laughs> Jesus manages to keep them up until two o'clock in the morning. And they still don't want to go to sleep. Showing his love to them. Showing to him that, they, that he cares for them. So deeply that they believe more than ever before that God really loves them too. And all that we did was we showed up. Remembering that Jesus did not only call us to our own people groups, but to be a disciple to the world. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the bottom of page two, we, uh, page three, we're making great progress, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know that in Matthew 1, that's not a difficult one. Um, in, in, in Matthew 1, when we read about uh, Jesus' birth, verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through um, the Holy Spirit. Um, so that word, uh, is she, she was pledged to him to be, to be married, um, uh, to be betrothed to someone, right? To be engaged to someone. Um, so, sometimes we, we, we don't really get that in our culture so that's another cultural difference and so i'm hoping that we will catch some of these as we continue because that also helps you um, as you continue to read other parts of the bible and understand that better um, so to be engaged was we we would be able to say i guess to be like a pre-married not engaged but Pre-married, we, we, we're kind of married, we're kind of married. 
Um, so the only difference would be between someone that's betrothed to a husband and someone that's married would be the woman would still live with her own family and there would be no sexual intercourse allowed. Um, and they are in that relationship for about a year. So serious that if a woman would commit adultery, um, she would be stoned to death. In Jesus' time, the law um, was a little bit less harsh and you would, you would divorce, publicly divorce that woman and, and um, she would be shamed forever. Um, and so, therefore, it was extremely serious. It was the same as you are married, right? Um, and so, when you marry, what would happen? The woman would leave her house, would go to the man's house, um, and they would start to have sexual intercourse, right? Um, so that would be the only difference. So if you are betrothed to be wed, if you are engaged, in other words, it would be as if you are married. So this was a very serious relationship, and therefore you understand the whole thing, why Joseph is a little bit baffled by this, and, and wonder ab about, about all of this. But then, of course, he starts to understand that Jesus um, does not, is not born from her. Um, she was not uh, impregnated uh, by another man. The Holy Spirit came upon her. She was conceived, uh, Matthew 1 verse 20, conceived in her, what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, verse 21. So give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. You will see nowadays there is an extremely high attack, it seems to be, um, of making Jesus less than God. Uh, convincing you that he's just an incredible prophet, wonderful wise person, let's learn about him, let's read about him, let's try and even be like him, uh, but he's not God. And so the Gospels continue to fight that and continue to show that he definitely is God. One of the ways that we learn that and what you lose when you miss that is that he will save his people from their sins and you go like I've heard that a million times before, so what? The so what is if he is just a prophet or an incredible person or a wonderful king like King David, what do wonderful kings like King David still do? Sin. They still yeah. sin. Do you agree with me? Mm. You know, some of the greatest prophets, when things got heated, they would do what? But they would run away, they would become fearful, they would become <laughs> doubtful, you know, so they are just human. If Jesus is not God anymore, with that goes out of the door, your what? Your salvation. Because whoever takes care of your sin cannot take care of your sin if they have sinned themselves. Mm -hmm. So if he is not God anymore, it means that he can sin. If he can sin, he cannot help you with your sin. Do you remember? The land that was slaughtered for people's sin had to be what? Perfect. Perfect. Without blemish. Broken leg, sick lamb, anything wrong with that lamb, lamb could not be sacrificed. What is perfect was needed to be sacrificed for the people's sin. This lamb of God needs to be God's lamb. God. And only then can he be sacrificed and can you be freed from your sin. So we leave it aside that Jesus is God. We, can, we are stuck with our sin. This is an incredibly important message that we need to communicate to the world around us as a disciple. That he is God. And because he is God, he can help you with your sin. Because that's what people want, right? They need help with their sin. They struggle in their marriages because of what? Because of sin. There's sin there and therefore they struggle with their marriages, right? There's sin and therefore they struggle with their families. There's sin and therefore we struggle with each other if we're from different culture, color, language, whatever. We struggle with sin. So we need Jesus to take the sin away so that we can love God and love each other 
as we should. So we need to have as his disciples that conversation with people. How do you get rid of the sin? Jesus takes the sin of way away and he can take the sin of way because you know no perfect human that, that can help you with that. But we know the perfect God <coughs> who can help you with that. Um, and then, of course, John helps a lot with that, right? So if you go to Luke chapter 1, verse 15, something incredible that we read there. Um, Luke chapter 1, verse 15. Um, so he's talking to Elizabeth and, 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 um, and the angel says, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, Luke 1.15. Um, he is never to take wine or other fermented to drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will, uh, will he bring back to the Lord their God. And you go like, why, why, is, that, why is that so special? Um, that, uh, you know, we, we know that he was special. He was incredibly special. Because nowhere else do we ever read, nowhere else do we ever read that the Holy Spirit came upon somebody from birth. This was the first. Remember, this is before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The Spirit could come over families, right? This is before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. People would, would grow up like Samson and so on. And then what would happen with him? The Spirit of God would come over him. And then what happens? Yeah. He becomes like Tarzan or Arnold Schwarzenegger or all of them combined, <laughs> right? And um, you see your superhero in action. The Holy Spirit comes upon people and then they act or they speak or do incredible things, right? But not from birth. Never from birth. So John the Baptist, the first person... Where the Holy Spirit comes upon him from birth. Which means what? Which means that God didn't want you to miss it. That there is a message from God. This is not just somebody saying some apostle, some prophet, some special king, some special person saying that, hey guys, don't miss Jesus. No. Jesus is being born of God through the Jewish nation to the world. At the same time, God gives a megaphone to the world. And the voice that speaks over the megaphone is who? Is God. It's John the Baptist from birth. The Holy Spirit in action saying, prepare the way. Don't miss this. Something amazing is coming. God is going to show up on earth. It is like, I don't know if you do it in America, but in Africa, it is, a, you know, like a, um, a, a, like a, a toy toy, like a, um, uh, <laughs> like a revolution or whatever, you know, people would drive through, it, through the streets and there would be a, Megaphones attached to the pickup, you know, and they would say, you know, hey, vote for Biden, vote for Trump, vote for oh, none okay. of the two, both of them. But anyway, it's whatever, right? <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, they drive around and they say certain things, right? They get you excited. They don't want you to miss it. This is John the Baptist. God doesn't want you to miss this incredible news that's coming. And so if we understand John the Baptist correctly, we can help people to understand it was not just Jesus coming to earth. It was also his announcer was God inspired to help you not to miss Jesus. Today, as the disciple sitting with you at this table, I am who? I am John the Baptist. <laughs> Because as God's child, I have who? <clears throat> I have the Holy Spirit. And so please know, my dear friend, my colleague, my brother, my sister, my child, today, my name, this disciple's name is John the Baptist. And I'm God's megaphone. Wanting you longing for you, pleading with you not to miss Jesus.
not to miss Jesus. Do you realize that? You think this is amazing? You think, well, why could I not have been John the Baptist? Wouldn't that be so cool? Mm -hmm. You know, I know I'm a girl, Vicky, right? But man, you know, <laughs> I would love to be John the Baptist. This, uh, this is a bad, that's a bad example in our day and time. Well, okay, let me not go there. Yeah. <laughs> but you understand what I say, right? You know, don't forget the whole gender thing. That's just weird and awkward. Um, but, but man, I, w I would love to be, um, you know, um, I don't know, what's a woman name of John, you know, John? Joan. Yeah. Joan. Joan. Joan, I would love to be Joan, right? Joan, <laughs> that, that, that's better. Okay, now we're getting it right. I didn't think that through. Um, you know, I, I'm, Joan, I'm Joan the Baptist today for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and today, my job is to help you not to miss Jesus. It's not just me talking about somebody. It's the Holy Spirit that had moved me so that I could show up, so that you could hear that there's someone that can take your sin away, that there is someone that can give you a new beginning, right? And you're saying that all of us have that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because all of you have the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. All of you have the Holy Spirit. So, so, so John the Baptist are all around us today, right? All around us, right? So we could be a disciple like John the Baptist. Um, chapter 1, verse 26 to 38 um, of Luke. Chapter 1, verse 26 to 38. Um, so um, the angel comes to Mary and, and, um, and Mary, um, you know, is so excited about the Holy Spirit that will come upon her. Verse 35. The power of the Most High that will overshadow her. Um, and then she gets this message that verse 37, everybody loves that, right? Everybody has that underlined in their Bibles. If not, then you're doing it quickly right now. Verse 37, for nothing is impossible with God, right? Um, Luke chapter 1, verse 37. This is the angel saying to her, nothing is impossible with God. Elizabeth in her old age can have a child. And you can have a child without a, a man having intercourse with you. And then she says in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Man, I think if there is something that you want to practice as a disciple of God, you know, Mary, the mother of Jesus, um, is right there getting a first bird's eye view, you know, a first view of the first disciple, right? And so she, she's living right with him right from the start. And the first thing that she does is she submits completely. Mm -hmm. She submits completely. If you want to be a great disciple of Jesus Christ, you need to do what? You need to submit completely. You need to say, Lord, here are my plans. Here are my dreams. Here is my resources. Here's my experience. Here's all my qualifications. Here's my home. Here's my car. Here's my children, here's my marriage, my family, my church, my small group. Here it is. I want to submit it to you. And I wonder what the answer to the prayer would be if you would say, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you say. Whatever you say, right? Right? It's that question to where the answer is always yes, right? What's the answer to God? Yes. What should the answer to God be for a disciple of God? Yes. yes. It should never be anything else. Definitely not maybe. Like God goes like, I want you to go and make peace with somebody. Uh, maybe. <laughs> I want you to go and, you know, forgive that person next month. Lord. I, I, I want you to go to South Africa and go and bring a message there. Please ask somebody else, Lord. Right? Is that the answer? No. 
It's like, yes, yes, yes. Why? Because you know that God always wants the best for you. If God always wants the best for you, who cares what the question is? The answer is yes. The question is, can you submit to a level where no matter what the question is, that you will answer yes because you completely have submitted every area, every area in your life. Because sometimes the doubt and the weight comes in because of something that ties you down. Either a spouse or a child or a house or a car or a good job or money or whatever or whatever or whatever. And so can you submit it all to God? So that when he calls, you can pick up it all and go to where God wants you to go, submit it all, and then show up. And then incredible things usually follow that. So, um, yeah, you go and read the great songs of Elizabeth, Mary, Zechariah. What, what do we all see there? We are all in awe of the Savior's arrival. Do you remember all the praise songs that you find in Luke chapter 1, verse 39, up to verse 80? It's one song after another, after another. They are in awe of Jesus. Can I tell you tonight... If you are not in awe anymore, in wonder anymore of Jesus Christ, you can forget about being a disciple. You can just stop right now. You're wasting your time. Go and do something else with your time. You know, I don't know, watch Bold and Beautiful. Is that still a thing? <laughs> some, 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 it's not a thing anymore. Okay, that's from my days. That's, that's the last time that I watched a soapy. Um, so, yeah, how long ago that was. But, um, you know, so go home and, uh, I don't know, play some video games or whatever the people do nowadays. Um, but, but if you are not in awe of the first disciple, well, why do you think you, you'll want to be one? You know, are you still in awe, in wonder of who your Lord is, right? Because that is what moves you. If you're in awe of your president, you'll show up and you'll fight till death, right? You'll fight for that flag until you die. If you're in awe of your president, you'll pay your taxes no matter what, what he or she asks from you. If you're in awe, you'll drop everything tomorrow and you'll go wherever your president wants you to go and do whatever he wants you to do. You're not in awe of him anymore? Well, he'll, he'll not do what he wants you to do. The great news is tomorrow he will forget what he has asked you to do. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, on page four. <laughs> on page four, the third bullet there. A disciple of Jesus enters a space where God is completely at work. Okay, are you with me? Page four, there at the top, the third bullet there, um, below the text, the text, I mean. A disciple of Jesus enters a space where God is completely at work. So don't forget that. You know, if I realize that I need to bring this wonderful news of a new beginning into Tammy's life, right? And I walk over to Tammy. I need to remember that when I enter this space, it's not just Tammy and the coffee or whatever on the table anymore, right? I enter a space where God is completely at work, right? That's a powerful thing to realize. Do you agree? That's a powerful thing to realize. So when Jesus shows up, you know, John the Baptist wants to remind the people when he shows up, you will see God completely at work. And therefore, therefore, the impossible becomes possible. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what you were wondering and thinking, can we make a difference by paying a lot of money to fly thousands of miles, to go to a jungle, to a people group that we have never met, language that we cannot speak, to be there for three days, can we make an impact to these people? The answer to that question is absolutely no. There is no way on earth that you can make a difference. Right? It's impossible. If you remember, though, that you are entering a space, if God has told you to go, right? You're acting on what God is calling you to do. 
You're entering a space now where what? Where God is already there. Where God is completely at work. Therefore, the impossible now becomes possible. possible. Can I ask, who would not want to submit to that? <laughs> but you see, we don't want to submit, or we think of excuses to submit, because we are not in awe anymore. We, we, we think it's just us. We, we think, what will I say? We think, do, 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 can I do this or do that? Can I accomplish this? Will I make a difference? Um, so, so we're stuck in this world and our own abilities and, 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 and own boundaries. But if we realize that when I'm a disciple, that the Holy Spirit is working in and through me, I'm showing up at a space where God is completely at work, Therefore, the impossible can become possible. And therefore, I don't know about you, but I want to jump into that. I don't want to wait. I don't want to be scared. I, I, I want to jump in with everything that I've got. And I know it's going to be so great, but I want to take my wife and my children and everybody where I can with me. I want to submit to this because this is so incredible. In chapter 2 of Matthew and Luke, um, you will remember that right from the start, right, it's the story of King Herod. Right from the start, there are the wise men, they're excited. There are the shepherds, they are excited, right? And then there are King Herod, and what about him? He's not only rejecting Jesus, he's violently rejecting Jesus. Do you agree with me? <laughs> violently rejecting Jesus. And, and, and therefore... Um, you need to remember when you are discipling people, not everybody will accept what you bring to them, right? Mm -hmm. And some of those experiences might be deeply painful and very uncomfortable to you. And then you need to rejoice in that and remember that your Lord went through that too as a baby, mm -hmm. right off the bat. Some are excited, some want to murder him, right? That he needs to move to another country to get out of the way of him, right? Um, I don't see how many of you had to move from America because of your faith yet. None of you? You haven't really suffered that much yet, right? You realize that, right? None of you had to leave the country because of your faith. Flight, like, let's go, pack our bags, life in danger. None of you, therefore, has suffered yet, as Jesus had suffered for what he brought to the world within the first couple of years of his life. So please, can I just be blunt with you? Can you just get over yourself? <laughs> Is that okay if I just say that? I'm sorry, I don't know a whole lot of you, yeah, so I'm not okay. sure how badly I'm offending you. Please come back next week. <laughs> can, can, you, can we just please get over ourselves? Oh my goodness, you know, the cuss words that that guy said to me, I will never forget. When I started to talk about Jesus, like, keep your F mouth, you know, and get out of my F office. Like, that was horrible. I don't want to be a disciple anymore. It's like, here you sit, you're still eating your pizza, and you still have a car to drive. And you can still speak your own language. It's like, come on. You've got to be kidding me. How bad are you suffering? You know, uh, did you lose your job because of that? You know, did, did you lose a portion of your salary because of that? Well, what suffering are you talking about? <laughs> you know what I think? I think sometimes a lot of the suffering that's stopping us, a lot of the rejection that's stopping us, is literally in our head. <laughs> you, you had one person cussing to you, but it feels to you, the devil tricks you, makes it feels to you like a hundred people have cussed you. Someone was ignoring you for a day. It feels to you like they've been ignoring you for five years. It was uncomfortable at your work for a week. The devil makes you think 
It was uncomfortable for all of your life. You had one person, you know, walk out of the conversation. The devil makes you think everybody that you talk to are offended and wants to leave the conversation. I'm telling you, dear brothers and sisters, I've been doing this a long time. And I think I offend people just about every time that I open this African mouth of mine. <laughs> and I cannot believe it. People still show up. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. You know, this is what I think. I think if we do what God wants us to do and say what God wants us to say, some will reject it. More will accept it. Mm -hmm. The devil knows that. And therefore puffs up the rejection so much that it feels to you like you're being rejected all the time. Mm -hmm. So why don't you be honest with yourself and ask this question, how many times have I really suffered for the Lord while being a disciple? How many times have I really, really experienced rejection? And what was the level of that rejection? My guess is you will probably have to agree it was at the end of the day not that much would you agree with me i, I don't know so last page this uh, page five at the top there matthew 3 mark 1 luke 3 um, <coughs> nobody should miss the coming of jesus right so john the baptist is making it really clear um, the angels is announcing it. Everybody's announcing it. Um, so what do we learn from that? The disciple of Jesus is so focused, so ready to sacrifice to present Jesus to the world. Focused and ready to sacrifice, right? So John the Baptist does, he just does not care. Do you agree with me? He does not care if he's going to be thrown in prison or if people are going to say what to him or do what to him. He just doesn't care. Even get the king upset with him. Do you remember that? He just doesn't care. He's focused and ready to sacrifice. Do you see that two words in the life of Jesus Christ, the first disciple too? Focused and ready to sacrifice. Do you see that in the life of Jesus? Absolutely, right? Absolutely. We will be here until next week this time to read all the passages to help you to see that, right? <laughs> Jesus is focused, ready to sacrifice. John the Baptist was like that. Jesus shows up. He loves that. A disciple is focused and ready to sacrifice to do what? To present Jesus not only to his own people, to the world. I ask you again, you know, who are the people that you are discipling to, that, that you are speaking to, bringing some great news of new beginnings, great news of, you know, the chains of your sin can be broken. Who, who are you busy with in a discipleship relationship with in your own life in this country? And then the challenge is, who in the world can you name? It might not be directly. It might be through a missionary that you are supporting. It might be through a book that you read to your grandchild. Everybody's going to buy my book, right? <laughs> so um, how are you involved in the world? I'm not trying, you, trying to get you to go somewhere. I'm trying to get you to understand and embrace and submit to this incredible fall that God not might, want, can, could use you in incredible ways to impact the world with his message. Well, what does that look like for you? How incredible would it be if you start a discipleship relationship, and we're going to see in the next couple of weeks exactly what do we mean when we use this word re discipleship re um, relationship. Imagine that you start to bring this new beginning, this great life in Jesus Christ to somebody, a, a, a friend of somebody that you know through Facebook <coughs> in New Zealand, and, and that person gets it. And, and, and becomes the next Billy Graham of New Zealand. 
Why is that not possible, right? Let's laugh about it, but in a good way, right? In a way like, ha, 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 yes, our God can do that. Actually, that's what these ladies mean, right? I don't try to make you feel bad, by the way. It's like, yeah, how awesome would that be? Years later, you read that, you're like, oh my goodness. I was wondering how God could use me to reach the world. He actually did use the stupid Facebook at the end of the day. He can. He can use it all. Of course, the world can make it all bad too. But you, he can use it all too, for his good and his glory. And so, you know, don't cut yourself short. You understand what I'm saying? Don't go like, I'm too old. You know, I'm, I'm not a man. I'm not a woman. I'm, you know, I'm stuck in a wheelchair. I cannot travel. I'm, you know, too poor. I'm too rich. I have too much businesses that I need to take care of, whatever your excuse is. Don't cut yourself short. Be focused. How? How am I doing this? How am I being a disciple? And of course, you are sitting in this class to help to sharpen that focus. We're going to do that, right? And then, am I willing to sacrifice? Am I willing to sacrifice? Right? You understand this. You, you want your child to be good in chess like Mickey? Well, you do crazy stuff. You're tired at the end of the day. There's no, I don't know how many great chess coaches you know in Mary, and there's none. So where do you find them? Outside of Mary and Columbus, are they cheap? No, they stupid expensive. <laughs> you know, but what do you do? You put your Nikki in a car and you take your child all the way to Columbus and you know, and they get a coach and then you sit at chess games that start early in the morning up to what time at night, you know, and you just sit there in a, in a, on the floor with your laptop trying to do your work. Does this sound familiar to any of the parents here? Pick, pick whatever American sport you enjoy, right? Is that what we do? We understand it. You want your child to succeed in something? You need to sacrifice in something. You want to be good at being a disciple? You need to sacrifice. Focus and sacrifice. Uh, ready to sacrifice, I mean. And then what? Then you'll be able to be the disciple that Jesus was and wants you to be. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time, hour and a half. It feels like, I don't know, for me at least, that we've been busy for one and a half minutes. Thank you for how you continue to speak through your word to us. And thank you for the wealth of knowledge and truth that we gain from you our first disciple to be great disciples to our own families and communities but also to the world and we just want to hear tonight Lord before the devil steals this from us we just want to be real quick to come and to submit so we bring our spouses and our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and our lives and our small groups and our communities and, and our churches and, and our businesses and our careers and, and this country and the leaders of this country. And we just submit it to you. Mm -hmm. We just want to lay it all down before your feet. And we want to say, use us, Father. Let us not be afraid of rejection. Let us rather embrace it. We are ready to sacrifice, sharpen us through the Holy Spirit. Let us be focused so that we will know that all that we need to do is show up. And when we show up, we will encounter you are there completely at work. And incredible, mind-blowing, impossible things can become possible so that people can find life in you and chains of sin can be broken and new cycles can begin and people can encounter Jesus Christ who came to this world but you, God Himself, came to this world and therefore we can be with you for eternity. So, Father, I pray that we will continue to enjoy reading the Gospels and come back next week even more fired up than ever mm. to be the disciples that you want us to be. May this message go out into this world in this week once again 
through this small group, through Kim and her small group going to Jamaica, may this message go out to the people of Jamaica in this week. May we be like John the Baptist, like Joan the Baptist. May we go and be a megaphone. Christ has come. And therefore, new life is possible. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. May you all have a wonderful, wonderful week. Thank you so much for having us.